Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to this big conversation about a big deal, our democracy. I'm Alex Sloan, happy Canberran, and um, I'm delighted to be your moderator this evening. And I'd like to acknowledge that I'm coming to you tonight from Ngunnawal country. I'm really thrilled that I live in a country that boasts the world's longest continuous civilization. I want to thank custodians past and present. And I personally hope that we can see a constitutionally enshrined voice to Parliament as laid out in the Uluru Statement from the Heart as soon as possible. This event is organised by PROACT. PROACT is a group of passionate locals who want the voices of all people in the ACT heard. They are an independent movement. They're tired of politics as usual. PROACT is not a political party and have no affiliation to any party. They've been inspired by the Voices for model from the electorate of Indi, I guess most famously, and from elsewhere. And PROACT helps people host active conversation. There's an ACT in that active conversation with their friends and colleagues to discuss the issues important to them. Tonight is one of those nights of active conversations and PROACT is delighted. It's been able to show Craig Rewcastle's new film, Big Deal, Is Our Democracy for Sale? and now host this conversation. So let me introduce our great panel tonight. Claire Dubé is a consultant with 25 years experience in human rights in Australia and internationally. Increasingly disillusioned by Australian politics, she co-founded PROACT earlier this year with the aim of increasing community engagement in democracy and getting a community-based independent elected to the Senate in the ACT. Hi, Claire. Hi, Alex. <laughs> also with us is Dr. Richard Dennis. Uh, Richard is the Chief Economist at the Australia Institute, which is our country's most influential progressive think tank. And I say this with heart and confidence as I'm Deputy Chair of the Board. Richard is one of the uh, Australia's leading thinkers. Without fear or favour, Richard will call out wrongs, injustice and greed when he sees it. Hello, Richard. Hey, Alex. And our third panellist this evening is Craig Rootcastle, Australian writer, comedian and broadcaster. He's best known for his work in The Chaser and for going through our bins on The War on Waste. Craig has also hosted the two influential series, The War on Waste and Fight for Planet A on ABC TV. And I was gonna say, you know, he's the chaser boy all grown up, but I reckon they were all just the grown ups at the time. Anyway, we were the ones lagging behind. Craig, lovely, lovely to be talking to you. I don't know about that, but yes, good to be here. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, now I'm going to start with you. Um, we're used to seeing you in front of the camera. Instead, you've opted to direct um, this film. Why? Well, look, I actually came, this idea had been kicking along for a little while before I joined it, and I kind of went along to try and help out with some of the writing and come up with ideas. <clears throat> and at the end of the week, I was told I was going to direct it. I was like, but I don't direct things. <laughs> and uh, look, they convinced me otherwise, and I'm glad they did. It was, um, it's a topic I've always been fascinated by, and I've kind of, it's one on my little kind of doodling pad of ideas. I've always had kind of money in politics as being one of the ideas to look at, but it was really good actually not being in front of the camera. I mean, I learned a lot, but also it was good having Christian be the host of it because he's probably not as much of a political tragic as me. And I think there could have been a tendency for me to kind of presume a lot of the stuff and kind of, it's interesting, you, you talk to politicians about this issue and the hardest part is that it's so much a part of the game that they can't even really compute a lot of the time there's a problem to it. So it's actually really good to get a bit of an outsider's perspective and to kind of see the kind of outrageous, hang on a second, you know, to like to see the shock sometimes about the normal way it's played out from Christian was really great because you're joined by a lot of people for whom that's the norm. And, you know, the point of this movie was not to show somebody broke the law. The point of the movie was, was to show this is the stuff that's in the law is no one's breaking the law as well. So, um, yeah, that no, was really, it was, it, I mean, that said, I'd, I'd just come off doing two climate change documentaries as well. And I always, I had been feeling, as a matter of fact, one of the reasons I really wanted to do this, I'd been feeling like the kind of money and politics part of the climate debate was the left out part in both of them. And so I was very um, much wanting to address that in some way. And Kristen Van Vuren, um, is he, he's not the usual suspect, is he? He's a bit of a surprise to be fronting this. Is that yeah? Is that point? He's been on already. I mean, this is it. I mean, he's very passionate about issues. Now he's not a he's not obsessed by politics, but he's a, he is very much obsessed by our country and how we operate. And you know, like it just yeah. But 
it's good. To, he, I think he puts things in a way that's not the, in political speak in a sense, which is, uh, I think, probably useful in this in trying to get it to, you know, a broader audience to kind of engage. Because this issue does, you know, polling kind of constantly shows that it's kind of a bipartisan issue and it's an issue that most people are really kind of put off by is the whole idea of <clears throat> money and politics and influence and that, that feeling that, hang on a second, my say is not being heard, that my voice isn't being heard. So yeah, that's the kind of, um, hopefully it gets to some others. It has that fantastic start, um, the little little drama play um, with Christian. He says, you know, when our children or grandchildren ask us, you know, when you realise the country was going to shit, what did you do? I wrote some tweets or made some cynical Facebook posts, <laughs> but, <laughs> but instead, you know, you want to do something. And I guess, Claire, that's exactly where you're coming from. You don't want to just tweet or do Facebook posts. Absolutely. And I guess, you know, the end point of that, of, of the film of, you know, get out there and do something, you know, that's, that's what we're about, that we were increasingly frustrated and disillusioned and felt disempowered about and unable to really engage in politics and said, we've got to do something about this. It's, it's not enough to be sitting back and just banging the kitchen table all the time and getting more and more frustrated. What can we do? And yeah, we were certainly inspired by Voices for Indi um, and that model. And it's inspiring to see that sort of move across the country, this wave of, of independence. And so we started to think, well, what could we do that in the ACT? What what might be the pathway? Um, and so set up um, Proact um, earlier this year, and uh, initially with a, a small group of of five on the organising committee, and it's it's grown from there. It's um, grown to having conversations across the ACT. You know, we've spoken to a couple of hundred people from, you know, from Hackett to Hughes from. Greenway to Garen, from O'Connor to Camba, all across the, the, the ACT. And for us, it is about re-engaging um, the community and hearing from people about what's important to them, what are the issues that are important to them, what's the kind of politics that they want, um, what sort of candidate do they want to see, and, and hopefully that will also lead to us endorsing um, a candidate for, for the, the Senate if we can find the right community-based um, independent. Richard Dennis, you do tweet a bit, you've been tweeting madly today I noticed actually but so much more I mean you just never stop writing and thinking what are you, what are you making of this process are we is it you know is it crackable is that the word <laughs> can we crack it <laughs> yeah look you know I, I guess I've always been at the uh, aggressive end of cynical optimism um <laughs> I think but but I say that because I think cynicism itself is a trap um, I, I'm, I'm deeply cynical about individuals. I'm deeply cynical about the motives of, of anyone that, that seeks power, frankly. Uh, I want to know why. I want to know what. Um, it's, it's my job to be credulous. So, so I think cynicism is okay, but it's, it's a dead end, which I think a lot of people perhaps don't realise is a particular dead end for those and I don't mean this in a left-right sense, I mean this in a genuine sense of for those with a progressive vision, for those who want to drive some change through government, for anyone that wants to drive change through collective means, whether that's uh, get a park built by the local council or uh, introduce a carbon tax, for anyone that sees the potential for collective action through the state, to solve a problem, cynicism is actually your enemy. Because all the right have to do is convince the swinging voter that government's crap, that they're all on the take, that it's all waste, that it's all... And, and, and progressives very quickly fall into feeling clever by saying, yeah, it's all crap, ah, big corporate, whatever. But if we actually lose sight of the fact that without a positive role for the state, if the public doesn't believe in that, then you'll never actually achieve anything. Now, if you wanted to cut taxes, reduce regulations on big business and privatise the bejesus out of everything, wouldn't your meta message be that government's crap? Like, if you wanted to make democratic room for taxing me less and regulating my behaviour less and entrusting me to deliver your essential services, 
wouldn't you want to run a decades long campaign that suggests that the state is inherently corrupt and broken and wasteful? So we have to be very careful to distinguish what an individual politician did and what a political party did from what politicians did collectively. And, and I think the film does that admirably. I'm not suggesting that, but I just mean we always have to pull hmm. back and think who wins from our cynicism. Right? That's, the, that's the kind of... Sorry, I was just going to say, be cynical enough to think your cynicism is being used against you. Come up a level with your cynicism, please. I mean, that, was the, that was the David Barrow point in the movie, which was yeah. kind of a real kind of penny drop for all of us, actually, when we were... And I was behind the camera and shit, yeah, it's like... If you're cynical and think this is all rubbish and you check out because of it, yeah. then those in power win. Yeah. You know, you, 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 your, your kind of cynicism has to engage, drive you to actually be engaged. And I think that's it. And, and it's, yeah, yeah, I, I agree. You've, you've got to get engaged with it. And, and, you know, you've thrown up the example of Indi and also the, the one at, uh, at the Channon um, against Colson Gas up there. Mm -hmm. You've thrown out those two examples that you can, you know, you can do <laughs> something. Yeah, and it's, it's interesting because I agree with Richard that it's not, like, I think there's a really kind of simplistic version which says, like, every decision that goes through Parliament is just entirely linked to donations and that. And it's not that... It's a much more complex game that's been played there. And your votes do matter and politicians do listen to you to a point. But at the moment, it's that there's an imbalance. It's like the, 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 the kind of how loud your voice is is quite quiet and it kind of happens every three or four years. And then there's this constant voice that's quite powerful there the whole time. And organisations like Voices for or ProAct and that, I think they serve another role as well, which is about continuing that to make that voice a louder in the from the community but also making it more present at other times than just elections as well and you know it's interesting because look you know it's, i think it's great all these people engaging with proact and, and voices for movements as well to be honest if you're sitting there watching this going but i'm a labor person or i'm a liberal person get involved in those parties because at the moment they don't even have their grassroots either so you've got the same problem within those parties is that the grassroots element of the community is not strong enough and the kind of donors and those other powerful elements are too strong. So it's about getting that balance back here. And that's what we really need to fix. Because I agree, it's, it, it, it's interesting that Richard said he's cynical of anyone that seeks power. Because one of the things that I'm interested in is that, that over my years, I've seen great people go into politics with really great intentions. And you often see them kind of come out really disappointed and you go, what happened? What is it about that institution, about that machine that's not working for those people that do go in with great ideas and wanting to achieve it? And I think that's the problem is we've got to fix that machine so it doesn't chew people out and spit them out. Yeah, both fix the machine, but also get the connection to the community much stronger. Yeah. And that's where that's I part think of the machine. Is, that yeah. is the machine. Yeah, this, this without what, that, it's like, that's, that's the kind of running machine that should be running. That's the treadmill should be us, the community. And Clay, yeah, you, must have, you know, when you've been in the process of, of, of you know, putting product together, people are like, look, it's just not doable, you know, you know have, a, have a go, but it's never going to happen. There's, we've only got two senators in this population and what of 440,000, Tasmania 450, you've got 12 senators, we've only got two. Most people are just saying, look, oh, you're going to go one label, one label, give it up. Yep, we've certainly heard that 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 argument many a time in our argument. Part of the reason that, that we believe we need to give it a go is just because we do have that one Labour, one Liberal, that means they basically cancel each other out. We've got to do something to get that voice from the ACT um, into the Senate. And we really do think that there is a pathway. We've done some pretty detailed um, analysis of it. Um, when we were looking to set up a Voices for kind of um, model here. We looked like all, um, you know, other Voices for looked at the lower house first and went, can't see a pathway here. But in the Senate, we can. Um, it comes, it's not an easy pathway, but it is possible. It comes down to one in six votes in the ACT. And from the conversations we've had, we think that there's a lot more people than that that are pretty annoyed with the state of politics at the moment, um, annoyed about the kinds of things that comes up in, in Craig's film and, and, and elsewhere, and saying now is the moment. There is a, a, a kind of wave across Australia, but there is also 
a, a, a level of um, angst in, in the ACT about the kind of representation and now is the time to make the most of that. And, and where does that leave the Greens, which is, you know, a progressive voice, and particularly here in the ACT, you know, in the local assembly, um, you know, where, where does this leave the Greens in all of this? Well, I mean, our analysis is that there will be, if you look at the, the quotas, without going into all too many of the technicalities of, of Senate voting, or we might take up the entire um, uh, rest of the, the, the webinar just on that, um, Labor gets more than a quota, the Liberals get less than a, a quota, the Greens sit on about half a quota, but we need someone who is in that sort of, for want of a better term, the kind of centre progressive space, who is able to um, bring together a broad church, some of those disaffected liberals, some from the Greens, some from elsewhere, and be able to speak across that community. Um, that is the pathway to, to, to victory, to that second um, Senate slot. What do you think, Richard? Oh, look, I mean, <laughs> I, I, I helped Kerry Tucker try and get elected back in 2007. I helped Lynn Hatfield Dodds and Simon Sheik. Uh, uh, I've, I've tried to help anyone that wants to win a Senate seat here in the ACT. Um, and, you know, I, I know, you know, Kim Rubenstein's put her hand up to run as an independent as well. Um, Look, I, I mean, to be brutally frank, the, the, the Greens' decision to support the Liberals' legislation to give us optional preferential voting in the Senate crueled the chances of, of, of getting, uh, of beating the Liberals here in the ACT. I, I, I raged against the decision at the time, uh, and in part because I said it's going to make it harder. For, for the ACT to elect anyone but a Liberal. But I, I, I support democracy. The, the will of the parliament was that we changed the rules. It, it made it harder for someone else to, to beat uh, the Liberals here. But harder doesn't mean impossible. Uh, and yeah, whether it's the Greens, whether it's a candidate selected by PROACT, whether it's, uh, whether it's Kim, uh, to, to win a seat here in the ACT simply requires uh, driving the Liberal vote sufficiently below quota uh, that now, after optional preferential voting and the exhaustion that comes with that, uh, there's there's more people voting for non-Liberals than there are voting for Liberals. So I'll that's stay on, yeah. No um, stay on this for just for a little bit. We will get back to the film, Craig. But um, just in terms of Kim Rubenstein, you know, um, academic, our probably foremost expert on Australian citizenship, um, uh, she, you know, was you know, floored by this, but has turned around and actually got party status. She's now got, I think, 1,700 members. So she's she's quite organised. Is there a, a danger that um, progressives can kind of work against each other to hand it to the major parties? Absolutely. Sorry. Well, yes, that's a danger. But there's also a danger that without new candidates running, you don't peel new votes off, off the old parties. There's There's risks of new parties running there's risks of no new parties running. Um, it's, it's democracy. Again, I, I much preferred the old rules, but I, I lost that fight, so I'll shut up about it. <laughs> um, uh, Craig, I hear people say, look, I hope we don't get like America. Uh, your film kind of says a bit about that. Yeah, well, I mean, in some ways, there, there are parts of our legislation that are less transparent than America is. And I think we just presume in Australia that we're not as bad. And there is a lot of, <clears throat> there's a lot of things we have similar, like we have no caps on spending. There actually are some caps in America. You know, we've no caps on spending, we have no caps on um, donations and that. So we've got a really, it's a system that's quite abusable in a way. And I think, we also have, I mean, as we look in the movie, we also have an advertising system where you can lie and make up as much as you like as well. So for political advertising. So you kind of you kind of see at the moment that I think Craig Kelly and um, Clive Palmer are kind of taking a system that's been set up with so many holes for abuse and are really abusing it. I wonder if it's going to make us go, oh, maybe we should tighten some of the problems here, some, some of these holes. Uh, but yeah, look, I think it is... 
it's a hugely problematic system at the moment. And I think we, we need to make some changes because otherwise we do risk going the way of America. Now, we're never going to be totally America. You know, uh, we do have a gun lobby that has a lot of uh, money behind it. We don't, it doesn't have the same influence because we've got different kind of norms underlying that America does. But when it comes to something like climate, we are hugely affected by lobbying, hugely affected by the kind of rotating, revolving door between politics and the, the industry and that. And so we have to fix these kind of things up to, again, make it so that that voice from community is actually being heard properly. What's your view about that, Claire, in terms of, you know, people saying, oh, at least we're not like America. Um, and the big deal sort of goes, well, you know, take a, take a closer look at this in terms mm -hmm. of our transparency, all sorts mm -hmm. of things. Absolutely. And I feel like we're moving in that direction. And now is the time to, to, to reverse that. I mean, and, and, you know, as Craig mentioned around climate change, you know, that's the big issue when we are talking to people, every survey that you, you see around um, is highlights that as the, the most important issue in town and what people are looking for action on, um, but also around other issues around sort of parliamentary integrity and um, things that, that speak to, you know, very much the, the topic of this film. That's what people are looking for. I believe that now is the time that we can um, kind of uh, stop some of the erosion of, um, the, you know, the direction that we're seeing of that erosion of, of the sort of um, democratic um, principles. You know, we seem to sort of have at the moment transparency and accountability and all of these things being tossed out the window, which means that we are going in that direction. But it feels like now is a moment to be able to um, return to back to some of the, some of some of the roots of, of get some of that grounding back into the community. Um, and Is there ever going back to you know non declaring a, a Paddington bear compared, <laughs> compared to you know someone's legal fees coming from some unknown source? I mean, it seems a little different, doesn't it? <laughs> I just think, is there any way back? What amazes me about the Christian Porter thing is that we got extremely outraged correctly about the fact he didn't know where the money from came from. And the only difference to our normal system is that normally the politician like Christian Porter would know where it came from, but we still wouldn't. And that's the problem. It's just like, I think maybe we should know it as well. And that's the, that's the basic problem at the moment. But what I find interesting about like proact and organizations like that is that I kind of always thought, you know, that this issue about the kind of, the rules of democracy and how it works and the transparency and that, that you'd only really be interested in it if it was getting in the way of your kind of major issue, like, you know, it's climate change or gambling or whatever, because there's so many of issues with healthcare, you know, all of these issues are kind of affected by that underlying architecture. But it's interesting that a lot of kind of people are now talking just about those underlying issues themselves as an issue. And that's great. I think, I think that really is putting a lot more focus on it. And that was, for me, was what tipped me over, I have to say, you know, of someone who is passionate about climate change, about social justice issues, what made us say, no, enough is enough, we've got to do something about it, is just this complete and utter lack of accountability. And that is coming through strongly across um, the ACT. Richard, how um, influential is the fossil fuel industry on our parliament, on our politicians, and for how long? Oh, I said no one's cynical enough. Um, oh, look, it's, it's extraordinary. It, it's it's just staggering. Uh, I mean, and, and the easiest way to kind of prove it is to just look at how nearly every other country in the world has a conversation. Because the conversation about fossil fuels and the conversation in, uh, about climate change in Australia is just radically different from nearly every other country that we might compare ourselves to. And so much so that in Australia, people think that Angela Merkel is a lefty, right? Because she is a scientist that takes the climate change seriously. In, you know, in Australia, we, we think it's kind of weird that Boris Johnson, even though he's this strange Tory, you know, is, is concerned about climate change. We're like, whoa, how, how, how weird is that? No, that's how weird our broken little country is. Right, because the entirety, and and I, you know, I, I think I've said this to you before, Alex. Like I, I went on radio, on ABC a year or two ago, and said, "Oh, by the way, you know, Australia is so broken uh, that uh, we, we, I, I can't come on radio and and point out that McDonald's employs more people than the coal industry without getting attacked." 
And not only I, but the ABC got attacked for me going on the ABC and fucking saying that. I mean, like, you, you're just literally not allowed to quote Australian Bureau of Statistics data about the fossil fuel industry in this country without, you know, being literally attacked. I have a PhD in economics. I reckon I can read the ABS data pretty clearly. But say that to a journalist and they're like, oh, careful there, Richard. You know, we don't want to be political. You don't want to say that the coal industry doesn't employ a lot of people when it doesn't employ a lot of people. Like that is how, you know, I could go chapter and verse on all the senior members of every former prime minister who's come straight out of the fossil fuel industry. We can go chapter and verse on donations. We can remember the time that the plucky little people of, uh, uh, of, of, of Bulga stopped the first coal mine, the, the Walkworth mine in the Hunter Valley was the first coal mine ever stopped in court because, you know, and, and the Australia Institute helped them with their case. The coal industry said if the mine got built, it would create 44,000 jobs, which would have been 10% of people in the Hunter Valley. Anyway, the judge said, that's rubbish and the mine won't go ahead. Rio Tinto appealed. Plucky little people of Bulga won again. So the global head of coal from Rio, who lives in, New, uh, in London, where of course they don't mine any coal, flew to Sydney and we changed the law and the mine went ahead. All right, it, it is just as simple as that. These people win every time. And it's not how most other countries experience life. It is a uniquely Australian phenomenon. I did and have a... So I, I did I, have a... Sorry, Craig, keep going. No, no, go, go. I was just a little while ago. I did... Um, I fronted a, a thing for the Australia Institute recently. Uh, Richard was speaking at it and they outlined... Um, the kind of case to foreign diplomats about how we spend, you know, 10.2 billion a year on fossil fuel subsidies. Anyway, I was, I was subsequently asked to an embassy dinner. And so I sat down and, you know, I thought, oh, this is very lovely. I was wagging my tail. And I turned to the guy next to me and I said, well, what do you do? And he said, well, I work for ExxonMobil and lives here in Canberra. So it was, I just thought, this is an extraordinary kind of turn of events from me yeah. fronting this, you know, yeah. from the Australia Institute to, yeah, true. I mean, this is one of Rich my neighbours. Anyway. Rich is right, though. I, I remember I filmed in, um, in Sweden for two weeks and talking about environmental issues and that. And it was only right at the end I was about to leave, I was like, oh, wow. No conversation do I have with anyone from no matter what side they were started with the thing about whether or not climate change was real. It was just entirely focused on how do we solve this problem. And you went, how ridiculous is it that, you know, I'm about to fly back to Australia and it's going to be back into that thing. Oh, that's political, isn't it? And it's just, it's not a political issue. <laughs> I mean, in, in a way, that's, that's the interesting thing about the Voices for Movements and that is that they've come about and they're having success in liberal electorates. I think exactly because... A lot of Liberal Party members really want action on climate change. And they're going, hang on a second, we always vote this way and we don't get the result. And similarly for Labor as well. But you kind of go, okay, well, if we keep doing this, are we going to keep getting the same result? And that's why I think people are looking elsewhere. Claire, you wanted to come in on? Oh, I was just saying it's amazing the amount of time and, and, and energy that is wasted by some of these debates rather than getting to the, the, the core issues, isn't it? And, and it's clear what people are wanting, it's, but it's unfortunate that some are not, you know, but that we're not being listened to. Um, and, and, you know, now is the time to shift that, I think, and this is the model that I think can. Oh, well, I'm watching, you know, Scott Morrison saying one thing in the US this week, but then flying back to you know, Barnaby Joyce and Matt Canavan saying something completely different. So, exactly. you know, how that's going to go forward. Um, Craig, has any country dealt with the kind of issues that you discuss in the film about transparency, about donation rates, about... Has any, any country actually dealt with it? And Look, Yeah, no, no country is perfect. I mean, there's um, probably the closest analogies are... Uh, um, Ireland and Canada for us because they're very similar systems there and they've both kind of put in place 
much tighter lobbying laws have put in place much bigger caps they've put in place a lot of restrictions as well but we don't actually have to look outside the country the interesting thing about this is that we've done a lot better at state levels so queensland and new south wales have both bought in caps or in queensland it's got you know you've got to have declaration of donations within se within seven days you've got much more up-to-date kind of ministerial diaries that are published if they meet with lobbyists and that so you know it's it's not that this can't be done i mean i just say if if, if queensland with the history that it's had in it, so joe's state can be ahead of us we can really uh catch up so yeah the, a lot of this stuff is fixed and look i'm not saying it's all simple there are there are free speech issues there are issues of balance and what you sometimes find i think that the new south wales approach was Liberals would make some reforms, which actually had some good reforms, but really what it was is kind of tipping it in favour of their side of this thing. And then Labor came in and Labor did, well, actually it was the other way around, and then Labor made some reforms, which were great, but also really tipped to their favour. And, you know, you really do need a kind of bipartisan approach to kind of just go, let's end this 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 um, arms race here. And I don't, I mean, again, don't presume that no politicians are in favour of this. I think there's a lot of politicians who would love to fix this and don't don't love the current regime. So, you know, with the right Richard, pressure from outside, I think you can. Richard, can you, you've just actually, you know, participated in a fantastic book about um, Nordic countries. Are, are there any examples there? Are they doing it better there? Oh, I think that the democratic culture in the Nordic countries is, is radically superior to that. But that's because in Australia, like, let's just look in the mirror. It's just bad. Like, you know, it's not just the data that says we're losing faith. It's the fact that, you know, our attorney general, our former attorney general thinks it's okay to set up a blind trust uh, and then step to the backbench. And the prime minister says, oh, look, the rules are working when the guy still hasn't disclosed what the parliament obliges him to disclose. So, you know, we, 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 we've really done a lot of harm to our democratic culture. And it's very hard to put these things back together because uh, as the history of the evolution of all democracies uh, has found it's really hard to get that kind of united vision at the beginning of about what the meta rules should be and they're as much culture as they are written down I mean the English don't have a constitution so so yeah I do think that things are pretty bad in Australia I think that's objectively true but they're not completely bad I mean let's not like so 10 years ago when the Australia Institute started pushing for a federal corruption watchdog there was bipartisan hostility to the idea like literally 10 years ago, both major parties were of the view that something happened about the air around Canberra. And while every state thought there was corruption, literally 10 years ago, no, 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 that's that's crazy talk. We don't need that. Now, don't get me wrong. The government's current proposal is, is, is weak and ineffectual, but there's now bipartisan consensus that we need a federal corruption watchdog. Have we got one yet? No. Am I settling for a promise? No. But is why why that change what happened how come 10 years ago there was bipartisan consensus we didn't need one now there's bipartisan consensus we do and we're yet to actually pass the legislation to create one the answer is because democracy actually works because no neither major party want to go to an election saying stuff it we don't need a federal corruption watchdog right neither of them have been terribly enthusiastic in government to do anything about it but they both know in terms, I think it was Sam Dastiari talked about the mutual arms race of donations. Well, there's also a mutual arms race about the need to at least be seen to be taking accountability a little bit seriously. And it yeah. does work. It's grindingly slow. It's grindingly slow. I'm too old for this. I was optimistic and less cynical 30 years ago, right? But it doesn't help to tell ourselves we never win. Because 10 years ago, there was bipartisan hostility mm -hmm. Uh, to same-sex marriage as well, right? So we have to remember that when we work our asses off and don't just complain that Rupert Murdoch and corporate and like, you know what? Power is never going to be on your side. So if you're waiting for the media moguls and the billionaires to line up behind you and say, let's fix the country in your vision, just give up now. But if you tell yourself you can't overcome these obstacles, then you're ignoring history, which is in democracies, the history of overcoming these obstacles. It is not in your interests to tell yourself or tell your friends cleverly that because of Rupert Murdoch and because of the mining industry, we'll all go to hell in a handbasket. It's mm. just not true. 
I see some questions there and I'll get to those soon. But just speaking of Dastiari, um, Sam, you know, and it was a good get for the film, Craig. Um, <laughs> it's great to see him with, you know, a little bit of regrowth there and you're sort of worried about him. Um, but he said, look, you know, he gave a, in terms of the spend on ads, he said, look, in the week before the election, it can be a million a night. Um, and I thought that was the kind of perfect way to say, yeah, and then that's feeding the media machine, you know, a huge cog of this. But you didn't touch kind of the media influence, the whole Murdoch media. And I wondered yeah. why in this film. Well, okay, a couple of reasons. I mean, one of the problems, I think, one of the, the challenges of this film was that there are so many different aspects of different types of corruption in, in politics. Like at the same time, you were having sports rorts, which is this kind of own type of thing, which is taking public money and spending it for the abuse. And there's, and there was, there's the Murdoch issue. The Murdoch issue really needs kind of its own documentary in a sense. It's, I didn't think that it was, it was very easy to be distracted from this issue, but it's, I think we needed to focus on it. Now, yeah, there's a lot of talk about the Murdoch thing. And I also think, to be honest, that, it can be a little bit too easy for us to talk about the Murdoch thing. Like Murdoch is actually a reflection of this same thing. Murdoch goes where the money is and where the power is. Um, you know, in the same way, it's They've no, gone green. It's, sorry, They've gone green apparently. <laughs> Electric cars. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, like, sorry, Craig, don't yeah, that's exactly it. They've started to write. You know. When the money started pouring in for adverts for Audis that are electric and that, they changed their editorial. It's it's not a mystery that Murdoch has in the same way followed the strength of money that is in that, that particular industry. They don't just put their money into lobbyists and donations and that. They also put their money into adverts, into those kind of, that in a way, the kind of, the that that network that happens that exists to affect power doesn't stop at politics and business and it's media is part of that so you know we didn't specifically go into it because i think it needs to be dealt with on it you know as as it's an issue on its own but it's it's part of it de definitely but i also think that it's very easy to just go it's murdoch murdoch is a reflection of the same power and money that we're talking about when we talk about donations and revolving doors in politics yeah except information i mean misinformation has been weaponized and mm. and we are seeing it here as well like absolute lies are told now and there's no I mean there's I, absolutely but but the, but the thing about that is that if you think about the climate change debate like Murdoch hasn't invented necessarily most of that stuff so what I think is interesting about this is that I think about this way you know you put a, a donation is only a small part of it right lobbyists play a very important role because their role is to make it come up with the arguments so that the politician feels like, oh no, I'm doing this for a justified reason. This has nothing to do with my commercial interests and nothing to do with donations. I've got these great arguments here, but they're all feeding on, you know, most of the arguments that are run by the Murdoch press or by lobbyists and that in many cases have been funded by fossil fuel companies, putting money into huge PR campaigns overseas for many, many years. It's the same little network here. So the misinformation is kind of just, used in many different places and the Murdoch papers are just really the kind of front you know the, the kind of forward facing part of it so we kind of focus on them the most because it's the one that lands on our dinner table but it's it's through every single one of these networks essentially. Claire what do you what do you think about that in terms of the role of the media in you know preserving or eroding our democracy? Absolutely I mean I agree with those points but I also think that it is um, the, the, you know, as individuals, we have a role to play. It is, a, you know, whether that is through our engagement in social media, it's community discussion and engagement that is the, the kind of way to counteract some of that. And yes, it is a David and Goliath um, in, in a sense that there is one that has, has all the power. But it is around those individual connections and conversations, whether online or even better in person when we're able to do so. Um, and that, 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 that other way to, to, to kind of counteract some of that. Um, and I think those, you know, reconnecting in our communities and, and not just with the like-minded, but also connecting with those that have different views and challenging some of those um, those views and perspectives is is the way that we're going to see some progress on that. Just a, there's a, some questions coming through. Um, Louise has um, asked a question and 
any of you can answer it. Why is, and we've probably covered it a bit already, but why is it that Australia is so behind in climate change accountability and is Murdoch um, part of the problem? Do you, Richard, do you put it down to the, the, the dollars from the fossil fuel industry or, you yeah. know, the power of Murdoch? Uh, well, the, 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 as, as, as Craig said before, they're, they're, they're wrapped up in each other. Australia is the third largest exporter of fossil fuels in the world. Okay, there's Saudi Arabia, there's Russia, and then there's us. Um, we have a bigger share of the world traded coal market than Saudi Arabia has in the world oil market. Right? This has got nothing to do, nothing to do with me putting solar panels on a roof. We are the third largest fossil fuel exporter. What we actually want is for other countries to keep buying enormous amounts of coal and gas. Our foreign policy, our nation state's foreign policy is to slow down the ambition of other countries. That's how ambitious we are, right? We're the 14th largest economy in the world. We're in the G20, we're in the OECD, we're in the Five Eyes Alliance, we're in the Quad, all right? We use our foreign policy to put lead in the saddles of other countries' ambitions because we can't sell that much coal if they're not buying it, right? The, we, we're the biggest exporter of liquid natural gas in the world. And in 2016, we didn't export any from the East Coast, right? We're only new to exporting gas. We're at Paris. We're at Paris at the climate talks about to launch the enormous gas export infrastructure. So, the, you know, we, we kind of talk about climate policy as if our emission reduction targets matter. And, you know, they kind of do. But, gee, we're lacking vision for what our nation state has done on our behalf for 30 years, which is try and slow everybody else down. So, yeah, why? Why is it so bad in Australia? Well, go ask the Saudis or the Russians why it's bad there, because they get the same answer. Craig, Craig, did you want to come in on that one? Or? No, I think, I think we've kind of covered that. I mean, just to say, though, on the Murdoch thing, you've got to remember there are a lot of times that Murdoch papers run very heavily for a particular party. They don't always win. So, you know, oh. don't, don't, you know, remember that, you know, power of the, of the community can win out over that. Yeah, and, and just very quickly on that, to be clear, the, the, the Courier Mail raged against Anastasia Palaszczuk, who won, won in a landslide, and raged against Dan Andrews, uh, the, the Herald Sun, who won in a landslide. Uh, don't get me wrong, of course the Murdoch media have a very strategic conservative bent, but it doesn't actually work on mass indoctrination of the population. What it does is it takes a marginal issue and it can actually pressure the parliamentarians mm. one way or the other when, when the vote counts. So, yeah, it's, 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 I'm not for a minute suggesting that they don't wield enormous power in Australia, but it's not the power to tell us all how to feel about an issue, but it is the power to marshal that at the right time and, and put it on individuals. And that's, again, why I think independence are so important. Independence... Like, you've only got to persuade the leader of a major political party that A is superior to B, and 50 MPs come in line with them. It is a lot harder when you've got eight crossbenchers that need persuading. It is a lot harder, which is one of the reasons the Murdoch press hates crossbench so much. It is a lot harder to marshal that kind of power and, and aim it at a diverse crossbench than it actually is against the Prime Minister or the opposition leader. Um, uh an anonymous question, but you know it seems it's fine. What, what was what um, to Craig? What was it like interviewing Jason Falinski and Zali Stegall at the same time? It seemed quite an awkward <laughs> engagement <laughs> down there on the on the coastline there. <laughs> yeah. Well, the coastline there's the direct line between the two seats, but they both put in a submission, uh, you know, uh, calling for greater honesty in advertising laws. So that's why we interviewed them together. And look, they actually. It actually was quite good. It was good to see them kind of banter off each other, to be honest. But yeah, there were some awkward moments, but that was intentionally so because though there was some hypocrisies perhaps being caught out at various times as well. But what's interesting about that, and I'll be, it'll be fascinating to see going forward, because Ali Stegler has now put forward a piece of legislation to actually change those laws that they were talking about. Now, 
is Jason Fonenski going to, and is he able to vote for that? And that's the interesting thing is, you know, here he's gone, oh, great, let's change these laws. Zali and I have put in you know, place the thing to the, you know, the inquiry and said we should change this. <clears throat> Does he then have the power to later? And that's one of those questions that kind of is coming up with independence when they're taking on moderate people in their electorates as people go, but you know, that person supports climate change and, you know, doing something about it. And you go, well, yes, but do they have the capacity to vote for it? And that's the interesting thing, you know, about parties, about the way they work at the moment is, you know, when I vote for a politician, because they say to me, this is what I believe, will they be able to enact that? And I think that's one of the interesting things. Well, Andrew Bragg has been running, look, you know, you've got to, you've got to stay with the parties because they, they can actually get things done. Claire, you must have seen those comments. Yeah. Um, yeah, what do you what do you think about that? If you did manage to get up an independent in the Senate here, um, what kind of voice, you know, what what could they do for the ACT? What couldn't they do for the ACT is what, what, more what I'd say. I mean, the way the way that it's happening at the moment, if, particularly in the ACT with only two senators, one Labor, one Liberal, basically they vote each, count, you know, cancel each other out. And so where is the voice for the ACT within that? Um, if there is an independent um, who is connected to the community, is grounded right from the start in the community, maintains that connection and is accountable to the community, then I would be much more confident that the views of the people of the ACT are going to be listened to first rather than the pa party position or big business or the variety of things that we've seen in, in, in the big deal. That's not going to be the touchstone. The, the, the point of connection is what the, um, those in the community in the ACT want. And, and you know, we've seen that um, in Indi, in Warringah, elsewhere, and also not just at the federal level. We've also been talking to others, um, you know, independents at, at um, state and, and sort of local council um, level as well. Um, and that's a real distinction with, of, of people knowing um, the, 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 the person that they're voting for, that it, um, what they stand for, um, and that they are able to maintain that connection um, throughout the term. And we, you know, we have one senator here who doesn't actually believe in the ACT's rights to govern for itself. I mean, exactly, exactly. What, what, what more do we have to say on on that point, really? Um. <laughs> did, did uh, Craig or Richard, do you want to come in? Um, do you think, you know, we would see a very positive change or impact in the ACT? Or did Andrew Bragg have a point? Or Seriously, I'm, because I'm, look, I'm not totally against the parties. Again, I think one of the part of the reason to try and fix the laws is to also make it so the parties work better as democratic organisations as well. Um, but I do think that, you know, having that change up of a different organisation, different group winning with community ties is going to also change how those parties work. They're going to go, oh, shit, we've lost touch with the community. We need to have a better grassroots system. There has been that debate going on in the ALP for a little while about how they're going to change that, for instance. So it fixes the whole system. And I think in those, you know, particularly in seats where, for instance, you know, it's a, it's a strong Liberal seat or a strong Labor seat, there's no chance that the other party will win. Having some contestability come in there with the community able to speak through another organisation is really great. So I think it has an effect on strengthening democracy even if it doesn't necessarily win it to be honest i think it has a role to play as well oh ab absolutely uh, i mean and look you know I, I'm, I'm not a member of any political party I'm, I'm not really much of a joiner to be honest but uh i i worked for the democrats i worked for natasha stop the spoiler i worked for bob brown uh i uh i've helped a whole bunch of independents over the years um i don't i don't think parties are bad i think parties allow a coherent package deal of complicated ideas to be put up and there's there's a lot in that because you know you get a lot of people sometimes say oh we, we should have sort of direct elections like ballots on every issue so i think that's crazy right because you know all those in favor of slashing taxes yes all those in favor of doubling spending on health yes right you actually need a coherent framework to say of the whole set of things has to go together. So I'm not anti-political party at all, but um, the, the problem that 
especially, and this is a uniquely Australian problem. In America, uh, well, we talk about crossing the floor. In Australia, we have this phrase, crossing the floor. Uh, you know, and, 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 and it's decades, you know, since anyone's crossed the floor. It's not well, maybe 15 years. Uh, you know what the Americans call crossing the floor, Alex? Voting. <laughs> they have no term for it, right? There is no phrase because on every bill, every member of the US Congress mm -hmm. makes up their own mind yeah. whether they will vote with or against yeah. or abstain. There is no sanction, all right? There's, sure, the president might pick up the phone and say, this bill's really important. I really hope that I can count on your vote for this. But the whips actually have to persuade on every bill their whole caucus. There is no phrase for crossing the floor. So on the one hand, the package deal of a party gives a coherence of a policy agenda, but what happens in Australia is this deliberate logjam where you'll have factions within a party saying, all right, I'll support your hostility to climate change if you'll support my hostility to same-sex marriage, right? And a whole bunch of MPs go, oh, yeah, fair enough, we'll call it a deal, right? So then we look in from the outside and think, oh, they don't have enough information on climate change or, or maybe they need to meet a gay person. It's like, no, they've actually formed a coherent secret but it's a coherent sort of set where they will block all sorts of change in exchange for someone else blocking another change and independents can sweep that away on particular issues in a way where the log jam i mean they're like including donation reforms as if there aren't meetings and i've sat in them by the way between incumbent parties cooking up deals that work for incumbent parties that make it harder for independents now it wasn't is there anyone in Australia who doesn't think that donations are done for a reason of influence? And I, I just, why do we keep doing it? No, no, it's true. But, and, and not, but interestingly, because, you know, Richard just talked about the horse trading over issues in a party. But one of the interesting ways in which donations and money works within a party is it's a power base. So if you're a really strong fundraiser, you can, maybe you're from, you know, a really rich electorate and you can get an enormous amount of fundraising you then use that to pay for different other members who are running and you give them the money and then they have a loyalty to you and i mean that's not necessarily bad but for instance with the way we saw it play out in in new south wales eddie obede used that power to keep control people and would say you know I, I, you know, Kate McClimate talked to us about this, you know, he'd say, well, you know, you're not going to vote against the pokies legislation, you know, you're going to vote, you're going to vote my way in this pokies legislation, otherwise I'm going to run somebody else in your seat against you. And it's interesting if you look at the current, you know, Parliament of Australia, there's some people there in the ministry that you might go, they seem to just constantly stuff up everything they do and they seem it's mystifying that they still have a job and they do it wrong badly every time. And you might want to look carefully at their fundraising because they're actually very good fundraisers and that's what they're good at. And that's actually part of their power base. So <clears throat> this is where by having a cap and going, you know, New South Wales is like, you know, you, I think it was 110, 120,000 per seat. This, that's all you can do. That's a limit whereby it doesn't mean that every member has to rely on all this other money and has to be constantly searching. They can get to that with, you know, reasonably grassroots donations and therefore can that pressure is off. It doesn't play such a large role. It doesn't mean it also affects the internal politics and the internal power structures of the party as much as well. And that's part of getting, that's part of just reforming the balance there. And in, uh, and in that context, is it any wonder that people have lost faith in politics? You know, yeah. the, the, the number of examples that come up in the movie elsewhere. I mean, for me, I, I really thought that, that um, Dusty Irie's comment around corrupt versus illegal and the fact that, you know, right and wrong doesn't come into this. And you think, well, if people have, if our elected representatives have lost their moral compass or perhaps never had it in the first place, either way, but it, to, to the extent that that's where the, where the line is being talked about, then no wonder we've lost faith in politics. No wonder mm -hmm. people are looking for something different. And, that, and that's what I found fascinating about Dusty Ari, just watching him, is that he's kind of dispassionately, he's not, talk, he doesn't, he's not talking on a philosophical basis. He's literally just lying out, well, we get the money from here and it's because it pays for this and it does that and that does that. And, you know, 
You go, okay, well, that makes sense. If that's what the rules are, of course you're going to bloody well do that. You know, if you do, unless you're just like, well, I'm going to do it the right way, well, why? You're going to yeah. be beaten by the person that's doing it that way. And, and this is one of the reasons, you know, one of the Australian Institute's concerns with the current like, or corruption sort of definition in the Federal Act is unless you have a very broad conception of what corruption is, uh, you really, uh, an investigator wouldn't be able to investigate a whole bunch of things. So the government's proposed definition is that the things they'd investigate, that they basically need a prima facie case for illegality. But when, when a whole bunch of things aren't illegal, they might still be <laughs> corrupt and or a corruption of process. So I think, again, you know, I think the film does a great job of exploring these issues, but you kind of got to go up a level to say, OK, how is it that a person, a minister or a senior bureaucrat who that you can pay 10 or 100 grand to sit next to, what's the process that allows someone with delegated decision making to having had the $100,000 lunch just make a decision that might shovel hundreds of millions of dollars? So, you know, and don't get me wrong, we need to reform donations, we need to reform donations, we need to reform donations. But the fact that the donation can buy you the access to an individual who can, at the stroke of a pen, give you a gift that big is a corruption of process, which is staggering compared to yeah. trivial sums yeah. of the donations. Themselves. Well, you're lovely. Yeah, you're a lovely farmer from Queensland in that, you know, and that was a fantastic, you know, little sort of, you know, how many meetings everyone else got oh, with yeah, Queensland exactly. Parliament and he's still there. And I mean, it was a fantastic example. Just in these final minute, minutes, Craig, from making this film, what, what would you change tomorrow? to make our democracy better look the reality is it's not one thing and that is it it's like it's you know you need the 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 you need a, a federal corruption commission because you need an actual cop that's enforcing this because half the times even when we do have the rules they're not enforced we've also got to make the rules a bit stricter because as richard, richard just said you can get the corruption cop there and go i keep seeing this shit but unfortunately none of it's against the rules here it's ridiculous so we've got to fix a lot of this you know it's actually it's a bit of a whack-a-mole as well you've also got to stop you know taking away from me the ability to give ten thousand dollar donation but i can still say to a minister you know what you resign tomorrow and i'll give you a four hundred thousand dollar job at my company if you leave that open you haven't solved the problem so it's a really is a thing where you need to kind of stick several band-aids and just fix it to kind of fix this system but essentially you need to go we need to reduce the voice of power and money in the system. We need to make it so that if I am a local member, my number one concern is constantly the people in my electorate. And that's just what we need to kind of fix that balance. So I don't think it's not one thing. I cannot give you one because if I give you one, they will get around the other way. <laughs> but when Christian looks up at the sort of the, the Milky Way, the stars, and there's the names of four yeah. politicians now all working you know, in very, very lucrative jobs. Um, it's depressing. It is depressing. And this is why it's all like every kind of institution that does tries to seek reform and this has a list of things to be done. You know, like Australia Institute's talked about this kind of stuff. You know, the Democracy Network's got a list out there, a framework at the moment. There's, you know, the Human Rights Law Centre's been talking about this for years. It is really, and they all tend to be the same list of things. It's not hard. We just need to actually do these things and put in place these just several changes to actually fix the system. You know, if we didn't have those political ads, as Jackie Lambie says, you know, those ads, they're all shit. <laughs> <laughs> if we didn't have those <laughs> for elections, Leo, what, how much, you know, how much yeah. lost? <laughs> That's what I remember when somebody says to me, but what would happen if the politicians, what, if, what would happen if the parties just had to rely on the public funding only? I go, well, you'd probably be barraged by less shit ads at election time. Is that a problem? You probably have to think more about what they did over the last three years. Is that a problem for you? No, it's not. Claire, <laughs> with, you know, holding these conversations, you, you know, rather than just tweeting or doing toxic Facebook book, book posts, you really want people to think about the future. To think and to talk. 
Um, to, to me, you know, Craig mentioned about, you know, need to reduce the voice of the powerful, but it's also about raising the voice of, of the individuals and the community. And, um, you know, if there's one thing that we can shift that I think that will make a difference, it's changing the relationship between the, the individuals in the community and their elected representatives. And I think the way that we do it is starting with us and starting the conversations with the conversations that we have with others. And so that for me is the way to, you know, again, to, to, to quote the film, the, the get out there and do something. That's the something that I think we should, all should do. Richard, the war, uh, the democracy. <laughs> um, democracy dies without high expectations. Unless we have high expectations of our democracy, we create room for the corruption. We create room for all the problems. And you can't have a democracy without politicians. So whenever you hear yourself or feel yourself begin to say all politicians this or all politicians that, what you're actually saying is democracy doesn't work. Now, I feel your pain, but your strategy is shit. If you were saying democracy doesn't work, who cares? Because the world is full of the counter examples and I assure you they are worse. So frustrating though it may be, compromised though it may be, you have to have high expectations of everyone who seeks elected office. And the minute you hear yourself begin to say, oh, but what about the other time when the other team did something shit? That, that whole what aboutism is actually ruining, and it's tribal and it's reassuring, but it's ruining our faith literally in democracy. And Craig, big deal is going to be screened on the ABC? Yeah, there's a, there's a two by one hour version on the ABC in October, Or, but if you want to see the movie version before that, uh, go to makeitabigdeal.org and you can find a way to see it. Although people at Proact have already got that opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> it was fantastic. It was a great, great opportunity. I enjoyed the film. Look, thanks for all you're doing. Um, I think someone wants to know why your books are upside down. Um... <laughs> uh, yes, well, <laughs> the system is upside down. It's also just because I don't want to deceive people. This is not my bookshelf. And so I also like that for people in a long Zoom conversation, if they get distracted, they finally go, hey, the book's upside down. Just give me something to look at, people. <laughs> the back, the background. Look, it's great to be talking to you all. Thank, thank you so much. And Claire Duvet, thank you for um, um, making this all possible. And Craig for making the film. And Richard just for, you know, railing. Yelling at the moon. <laughs> and the... <laughs> thanks, everyone. And, and thanks for being engaged. This is the, you know, it's great. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, great. everyone. And, and yeah, well thanks. done on the film, Craig. It's great. Yeah. Yes, it's yes. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Farewell. Thanks, Alex. Bye. Bye.